Okay, so I won't take it as being just like.
Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Chandler McWilliams. Uh, tonight, we're going to get to witness the talk by Astra Taylor, a filmmaker, writer, political organizer, director of the film Zizek, Examine Life, and her newest film, What is Democracy, that a few of you got to see here last week. Um, in that film, she takes us on a journey from Athens' groundbreaking experiment in self-government through the beginnings of capitalism and the mutations democracy suffers then um, through Italy and up to the current debt crisis. Astra is also the author of the American Book Award winning The People's Platform, Taking Back Power and Culture in the Digital Age. And she's the co-founder of the Debt Collective, which launched the first student debt strike in history in 2015, and has secured the abolition of hundreds of millions, billions now? Over a billion dollars of debt for its members to date. Yes. Uh, the group recently built a digital platform that automates the confounding process of contesting and disputing debt. What I've always been inspired by in Astor's work is uh, its predication upon the belief that philosophy needs to breathe to function, that it's inherently multimodal, and that it suggests that perhaps it has been trapped in books for too long. She does this through film and on the picket line, and I'm very happy to have Astra here tonight to talk to us. Thank you. Okay, we don't need such mood lighting, it's okay. Turn the lights back on, I wanna see the people. Um, no, lights, okay, yes. Um, thank you so much for that kind introduction. I mean, I really want to, to thank Chandler McWilliams for bringing me. Um, and he didn't, he didn't mention the fact that we're old friends from the New School for Social Research. Um, and I'm very happy that Chandler still likes me because in 1999, I was a precocious 19-year-old. I was probably objectively insufferable, I think. No? Um, but being in touch with Chandler has sort of sent me down memory lane. So I just want to say you're sort of the inspiration for the frame. So I couldn't believe that he was inviting me to give a talk about me. I was like, are you sure you want like a practice talk? So I'm just basically gonna talk about the things in my bio that you read. But you, but connecting with you again made me think about the phrase that was at the heart of the new school, right? Um, and at the heart of the new school for social research, you know, it was this idea of a university founded by intellectuals, uh, a later generation, you know, where, where uh, intellectuals in exile. And so this idea that we heard all the time at the New School was the idea of the public intellectual. And so that, I want uh, this talk to be kind of a reflection on, on that term, which, you know, at the time, it's sort of, I was sort of attracted to it, but then I also rejected it for reasons I'll discuss and how I've come to understand it for myself, like in a very personal way. I um, also just want to say that Chandler was way ahead of me because I remember one afternoon he came to me and he was like, do you want to do a, independent study where we design a constitution. <laughs> and I remember being like, you know, whatever, 20 years old, and I was just like, that is so uncool sounding. <laughs> um, and so this is from the woman who just made a film called What is Democracy, which is like the most uncool title a film has ever had in the history of the world. So anyway, I should have done it. I would be so ahead of where I am now. I still have time. <laughs> Um, okay, so yeah, this idea of the public intellectual. So, so in, in the New School, there was kind of, there were these academics and they would sort of revere, but kind of, they would revere the idea of intellectuals who spoke in a way that a broader public could, could understand. They kind of lamented the fact that uh, there wasn't space for this. It was supposedly like a tradition that had been abandoned. Maybe it still existed in like France. Um, but there was this, this, I felt there was this like sadness for this idea, right? Um, and if basically, you know, this phrase, uh, the public intellectual, I mean, it caught my ear. It was like everywhere, so it was impossible to ignore. But I think part of why it caught my ear is that I was so young and I was like, hold on, you can be an intellectual and like not even have a job. And that sounded good to me. Um, and it also resonated with me given my intellectual background. So I came from a place called Athens, but it was not Ath Athens, Greece, it was Athens, Georgia and I was unschooled in Athens, Georgia. And unschooling is this radically democratic, actually, I would say anarchistic way of raising your children. And so if you talk to my parents, they'll say that they're for non-coercive parenting, and this idea is that kids are naturally curious. You don't teach a baby to speak, right? You speak to them. 
and they want to learn. And it's a very, so it's a very idealistic um, way of approaching pedagogy and also child rearing. And it's this idea that just w people naturally want to learn, we're naturally curious, and we need to create the conditions that foster that and encourage it. And so it was this thing where there, was no, there were no classes, there were no grades, so learning was something that was just supposed to be everywhere, and the phrase that I heard a lot was, the world is your classroom. And I have my political critiques of unschooling as a left-wing person. I really believe in public education, and in fact, all of my activism is focused, or not all of it, but a lot of it is focused on economic justice and specifically access to public education. So this is, so, you know, it's something I'm still wrestling with, but there's no denying that this tradition of being uh, unschooled really, really shaped me. And so even though I have always been sort of intensely nerdy, I've never felt totally at home in the academy, and I think part of it was because I was unschooled. Um, so whether it was like my t years in high school or my sort of rushed experience as an undergrad or my time at the new school, I was always sort of felt a little out of joint. And I think you see this in all of my films, right? You see that I want ideas to be everywhere, exactly as you said, I want ideas to breathe and be liberated from books. I love books, you know, but to be brought out of the classroom or the library um, and outside of the 45 minutes or two hours or three hours of the seminar, right? Like, why can't we, uh, you know, be learning all the time? Why does, why does schooling supposedly stop when you're 22 or when you've got your PhD? And the thing is, um, so, you know, so I want ideas to be everywhere. So I think part of why this idea of the public intellectual resonated with me because it was this, it was this like glimmer of hope that you could be outside the academy and live an intellectual life. Even though I should say that I'm not at all outside the academy, I think of myself today as more like a barnacle, some sort of like benevolent parasite on the side of different institutions because I love scholarship so much and I love the kind of thinking that goes on in these places. Um, the other thing is at the New School, I didn't see myself reflected or like my future self reflected in the public intellectuals that were so revered. And so, you know, you're bringing back all these memories. And one uh, memory is, what was that book? It was like the Russell Jacobi book, The Last Intellectuals, right? Right, so this book, The Last Intellectuals. And so that, you know, is also like the sort of paradigm or model. And so I looked at that, I, I, it's like Irving Howe and Daniel Bell, and you know, these people who I didn't really see myself in, this mid 20th century, like guys who wrote for little magazines. And I don't even remember Hannah Arendt being mentioned as like a, a model at, during my time there. So yeah, there was this vague intellectual, the vague idea of the public intellectual, but it wasn't something, you know, I didn't see myself in the people who were held up as examples. Um, so I also didn't know like how to do it. Like how would one do this thing of living an intellectual life that was public? But what, I think what I understood that term, I think in my younger mind, I understood that term to mean independent. And I think this is actually part of growing up in Athens, Georgia, where there were no intellectuals, <laughs> but there were lots of independent musicians. And so I had this idea of the independent, independent cultural production, independent artists, right? And I was like, well, maybe somehow, why can't intellectuals be like that too, right? Like um, making their own, their own scene, their own world. So these ideas were in my mind, but you know, I still kind of defaulted to the idea that an intellectual was someone who would inevitably become an academic, and that their mediums would be the classroom, and teaching, and writing books. Um, the problem was, at the time, was that I, I thought I could do it. I thought I could do the research, and I thought I could write scholarly essays, and I thought I could really enjoy writing a dissertation. I actually just thought the problem with becoming a professor was that I would have to profess, and I had an intense fear of public speaking which is ironic because now I do a lot of it. But that was actually the sort of also the hurdle that made me think, okay, I have to find a different way and that would led me uh, to making my own path. Um, I've skipped a slide. Somebody made this to make fun of me. This is who I was when I was 19 and met Chandler. I was a teenage Delusian. So the new school did save me in some ways. Um, even though I got a lot out of a Deleuze and Guattari, so I'm happy. Um, okay, so then in 2001, an older and wiser friend took me to this movie theater in New York City called Film Forum. Has anyone been there? Yeah, Film Forum. Um, and she took me to a film that I knew nothing about. I just literally went in with no context. And it's called The Gleaners and I by Agnes Varda. Has anyone seen this movie? Okay. To me, this movie was like jaw-dropping. It's really just Agnes Varda, who now is probably like 96 or something like that. I don't know, Wikipedia knows. 
and she's taking us on this journey about gleaning. You know, what does it mean to glean? And it's a, it's, it's, it's a classic sort of film essay. And I walked out of the cinema and I was like, hold on, you can write with movies? Like, why didn't anyone tell me that this was possible? Um, and then there was Agnes herself, you know, and it's like, what, what was Agnes? I mean, was she an intellectual? Um, Richard Hofstetter has this definition of an intellectual. He says an intellectual is anyone who, who turns something into a question or turns anything into a question. And so she was turning everything into questions. She was asking questions about potatoes. And you know, what, what is the purpose of gleaning? And where do we do it? And can you glean ideas or just wheat? Um, and so I added film to this sort of still imaginary repertoire of mediums that my future self would use, right? And I thought, yeah, I'll still write because books are my first love. I love books so much. But I was like, maybe I could write with movies somehow or express ideas in movies. And then two years after that, I had talked my way into making a film about Slavoj Žižek. Um, and I had never been to film school. I never even like bought a book about how to make a movie. I was just like, I've seen some movies, I can do this. Um, and you know, I really, like looking back, I'd probably seen, I don't know, maybe 10 documentaries in my life, and I'm not exaggerating, because I was also raised without TV, because that's what happens when your parents are hippies. Um, but I really milked all the films that I had seen for all they were worth. So from Manufacturing Consent, Noam Chomsky and the Media, I got the idea of animations and expressing ideas with animations. From Don't Look Back, the Bob Dylan film, which is what you watch when your parents are hippies, I got the idea of like writing words on paper. Um, I think the idea of filming him in the bed actually came from uh, the Leonard Cohen film, where he's like maybe in a, bath a bathtub or something like that. Um, this is all a long time ago. I also learned from some films things I didn't want to do. So I don't know if you all remember, but around this time, or maybe four years before, a film about Jacques Derrida had come out called Derrida. And a motif that film returned to was Derrida in the kitchen buttering his toast. And it was kind of making a commentary of like, yeah, do we know someone when they're behind the scenes? But it really, watching that made me think, you know, um, it, it was the beginning when I started to grapple with like, what does it mean to show that you've connected with someone or you're really revealing someone in a movie? Um, uh, and this is, this is an aside, but there's, there's a lot of contempt within the film world for talking heads films or interview, like standard interviews. Um, and the idea is, you know, okay, we should kind of follow people for a long duration in a kind of direct cinema style, maybe until they sort of forget the camera is there. And my approach is the, exactly the opposite. Like I want, I think you can meet someone for 20 minutes and connect with them person to person, mind to mind, and like learn more about them than you would watching them get dressed in the morning or put themselves together. So that was sort of a thing I was, I was working out at the time. Um, uh, so then after, after I made Zizek, I decided to like watch two or three other documentaries. And you know that was my like year's diet <laughs> of films, <laughs> but one of them was this film by the filmmaker Ross Mickelwee called Bright Leaves. Okay, does anyone know Ross Mickelwee? And it's, he's got a film Time Indefinite, which is in my pantheon of like amazing essay films. Bright Leaves is not as good, but it had a scene that I got something from, and it's a scene with a film theorist whose name I forget. And the film theorist is saying, you know, why are you going to interview me? sitting in a chair in a movie theater, you know, and he says, essentially, cinema is a kinetic medium, right? And it was just this, like, lightning bolt where I was like, yeah, moving images move. Moving images must move. And I was like, oh, d you know, uh, that's right. That's, that's, that's what film is about. And at the same time, I was reading a book uh, by the author Rebecca Solnit called Wanderlust, which is a history of walking, a political history of walking. Um, and I'm someone who's just, like, by nature, really physically lazy. So part of what this book did was it gave me a whole theory of walking. So then I started to like walking. Um, so that, it changed my life on that front. But it also made me understand walking in this broader historical context, who's allowed access to public space. Um, also, she called attention to the connection between walking and thinking, right? Walking and contemplation. And this is such a live motif throughout philosophy. If you go back to the peripatetic school of Aristotle, this idea of teaching while walking, um, you know, Kant famously took his punctual walks every day, except for the day he heard about the French Revolution, right? I mean, if you look at the history of philosophy, there's just all these great, great quotes about walking, and it's something that philosophers like to do. Um, and so that gave me this idea of shooting these interconnected walks, 
But my sister, so this is my favorite, I'm just gonna come out and say it, this is my favorite scene of the whole movie, which is the walk with Judith Butler and my sister, Sonora Taylor. And as I was conceiving this film and walking was at the center, I felt that I was really onto something by having a film that would be organized in this way as these, these, um, these excursions. And yet the fact that my sister is disabled, uses a wheelchair and that she doesn't walk but also that access is such a big issue with her was on my mind. And, um, and I invited my sister just to join me for one of the coffees with Judith to talk about logistics and filming. And by the end of the coffee date, Judith was like, well, I think Sunny should join us in this, in this film shoot. Um, and so that, this is sort of the scene that sort of troubles the whole premise of the film, or not troubles it, but adds this whole other dimension, right? It, it, it expands the meaning of walking in a really interesting way. And so this idea, like the tagline for this film, it's on the DVD cover I showed, is philosophy is in the streets. So again, it's this idea of trying to take ideas um, out of the ivory tower, not take them out only, but also show how they're already all around us, right? Um, and so in that film, I wasn't being a public intellectual in the sense that I was there in public uh, in this nostalgic mode that I encountered at the new school, right? I wasn't this like erudite old guy critiquing everything in the pages of a little magazine. But I was bringing intellectualism into public space, both like in terms of actually filming in this way, and then also in terms of presenting a philosophy film in a cinema or in a community center, right? Or in somebody's living room. And the reaction I got from a lot of people as this film went around um, was you know, that it was really refreshing to maybe reconnect with ideas they hadn't gotten to play with since they were in college, right? Um, or that it was just neat to be in a room of people watching a movie about philosophy. And this film has had a pretty good life. I think it's had a better life than I could have expected at the time. Because when I pitched it, I was literally told by commissioning editors around the world that it was the worst idea for a movie they had ever heard. Um, so, you know, I think I'm, I'm happy with, with how it's done and, and the life it's had. But after it was finished, I felt a little bit like I had lost my own personal thread because I'd never wanted to be a filmmaker per se. I mean, again, I'm not like a cinemaphile. Um, and so I didn't have the same ambitions as some of the filmmakers I met, so I didn't like want to crank out films. I wasn't really worried about like trying to get a bigger budget to make a bigger, more popular film, and I also didn't want to take the like leap into fiction, which is where a lot of filmmakers, documentary filmmakers' ambition lies. I mean, my favorite movies tend to be pretty small, um, or they even are like never distributed at all or shown in micro cinemas. So I was kind of already working at the scale of the weird movies. Like I was already happy in my ecosystem. Um, so the thing is, you know, the thing that I had always wanted to do, I'd always wanted to write, because if I, I might watch like five or six movies a year, but I sometimes read five or six books in a week. And I also always wanted to be an activist, but the problem was that it was the aughts, and there wasn't an obvious social movement for me to join. Um, you know, I like just missed the global justice movement. It was kind of like just out of reach. Um, the anti-war movement, I mean, 2003, we had what was then the world's biggest demonstration. It was dismissed as a focus group and sort of fizzled out. Um, and in two, so Examine Life came out in 2008, 2009, and the biggest political moment, movement of that moment was the Tea Party, right? So conservatives were organizing in mass against the financial crisis and, uh, or m sort of, they had been motivated by the financial crisis, and progressives at that moment were nowhere to be seen. And so I was thinking like, what am I, I don't know, where do I belong in this? How, what, what should I do as someone interested in ideas and politics and power? And, and the thing I turned to was the internet. It seemed like as someone interested in those things, in politics and power and also culture, that, that the internet was something that was important. Um, and so that was like, Going back to that time, it was like 2002, 2009 actually is when I wrote my first essay about the internet. Um, and it was this moment where there was all of this idealism. So there's all these pundits. It was like the hype of the web 2.0 boom. <laughs> there's all this hype about how web 2.0, which we now call social media, was transforming everything and gonna democratize culture and, and political life and, um, you know, uh, you know, the laundry, all of these things. Um, and so 
as Chandler said, the, the book, the book that I wrote was called the People, is called The People's Platform, Taking Back Power and Culture in a Digital Age. And, um, and culture is, is important. So on the one hand, what I wanted to do was write an accessible political economy of the internet. So kind of like, you know, Noam Chomsky has done this very well for traditional broadcast media. You know, how are messages uh, manufactured and who do they serve and what, is, what, what about the money, follow the money. Um, but my book has a different angle in part because it's rooted in my experience making films and as a culture maker. And it sort of it feels a little dated, but it's, it's tough to remember that at that moment, the sort of fundamental analogy that was being drawn about how the internet was going to transform everything was from the music industry, right? It was like, what happened with Napster in really, like Napster's going to destroy the traditional music industry and that will happen to everything else. And there's this idea that disintermediation was going to come and artists would go direct to their fans in this like individualist, disintermediated paradise. And from my view, um, you know, it was it, this sort of simplistic portrait of what life is like online and ignore the fact that there were these new massive mediators emerging, right? Like Google and Facebook are not distributing our content out of goodwill. They're sucking data out of it and commodifying it. <laughs> and, you know, the social effects are a lot more, more visible now. But yeah, but uh, these analogies would always go to the arts, and it was like these people who were writing these books had never spoken to a musician trying to make a living, or you know, and thought that you know every artist's ambition was to have their music used in a commercial. Um, so I, I rooted the critique um, in in my practice as a filmmaker, which then also allowed me to think too about labor, right? I mean, so part of the conversation too was that the internet would allow this whole flourishing of amateurism, and you know, it was also like okay, so. But whose interest does that serve? If pe everyone's an amateur. It's like we're all interns forever on, the <laughs> on Facebook. It's like, and other people are getting extremely, extremely rich um, and profiting from, a, uh, from, our, from our connections and from our creativity. So, so if Noam Chomsky talked about manufacturing consent, right, which was an idea he, he actually gleaned from elsewhere, but he sort of made famous, um, manufacturing consent, you know, my idea was that the internet is bringing about this age of manufacturing compulsion. So yes, there are as aspects of manufacturing consent, you know, who, uh, you know, controls the discourse, what interests are being served, but then it's also, we are in a different uh, media space, so in contrast to the top-down model, now it's just like, you just need to click, whether you click on garbage, whether you click on rage, or you click on hope, or you click on, you know, cute puppy, right? It's just, uh, as long as you're compelled to click. And the other argument in the book is that we had been blinded by, in the discussion of sort of new media, in, of new media, we, there was an overemphasis on change, right? It was a digital revolution and continuity was ignored. And so what I was looking at was a way that these three facets of consolidation, centralization, commercialism have carried forth from the old, old media model. I mean, digital media is even more dependent on advertising, but advertising, um, more dependent on advertising than the system that came before it, but advertising online is far more pathological and invasive. Um, it's not just that it violates your privacy, but the way that behavioral tracking works and targeting works is that, you know, people don't know when they're being discriminated against. You don't know if the ad you're seeing um, is actually offering you a predatory rate or, um, or, you know, hiding other important things like are you not seeing job offers that are valuable um, because of the demographic you're in. So. Uh, but the big argument is that continuity is, is maybe more important than change, but, but not seen. And that the internet, this digital technology is sort of used uh, to bring about what I, what I, not in the book, but afterwards, it sort of struck me that it's like a, this retro future, right? So digital technology is the Trojan horse that helps circumvent labor law or consumer protections. Um, all of these hard won but imperfect uh, gains, even the ADA, the American with Disabilities Acts, right? Um, and so, yes, we, can, we have phones in our pockets, but, you know, well, whose interests are they serving, right? Uh, what, what are the social consequences? And my analysis of digital media, I think it was sharpened, I don't know where the book would have gone, but it was definitely sharpened by the emergence of Occupy Wall Street. And I, I think an alternate title for the book could have been Occupy the Internet, which raises all sorts of questions like, where is the Internet? How do we occupy it? You know, how do you commit civil disobedience in di digital space? I think these are still really important questions that we need to figure out. Um, 
But yeah, Occupy definitely left its mark. And so, um, you know, and as I said, you know, when I was making those films, I felt like I was a bit off course because what I always wanted to do was to be an activist. And so on that first day of Occupy Wall Street, I went down to Zuccotti Park. And for me, it was a very interesting day because I had been, on lower, I'd been um, in lower Manhattan on September 11th. And so here, it was almost, you know, it was 10 years later, September 17th, 2011. And um, what struck me was that the people, were, people were able to stay at the park overnight. And that, I felt like, was, a, was sort of testament to the fact that something had shifted. I had never been at a protest in New York where we weren't just, like, kettled by the police with that orange fencing and just dragged away. And I, I actually left at dusk because I just assumed that that was what was going to happen. And I have a nice bed to sleep in. So I went away like a chicken. Um, but, you know, Occupy was, uh, was ridiculous in lots of ways. Um, it had a really annoying drum circle. And so one of my favorite signs from all of Occupy Wall Street was this person who held the sign that said, I love democracy more than I hate this drum circle. <laughs> Which I thought was such an important message, though, because social movements don't come like catered to your aesthetic sensibilities. Right there. They're messy. They're annoying sometimes. And at the moment, I was just like, this is what we've got. Like, it's the Tea Party or this or nothing. Unless, like, all of us who have better taste are going to go make something else, which you're obviously not going to do. So I, you know, I decided, I made the choice that I would, like, throw down and try my best to participate in a constructive way. But this is actually a photo of the first day. And um, um, so part of why I kept returning is that this was the first day, and it was unlike anything I'd, a protest. I've, it was unlike any other protest. We didn't march and shout. We didn't like stand outside Goldman Sachs. We went to this park, and they were like, "Okay, everybody, sit down in circles, and talk." And so there were dozens and dozens of these circles, and the idea was you're supposed to talk about what what is your one demand. And so I didn't know half of the people in that group. That's me in the blue shirt. And we just sat and we talked for a few hours and we just talked about this, what would be our one demand? And it's quite ironic because Occupy was very infamous for not making demands, right? Because the whole idea is we don't, as a movement, we don't want to make demands and legitimize the state. So it was a demand, uh, demand free zone. <laughs> but the first day the question was, what is your one demand? And so we sat there and we talked about what made us come, what we were feeling, what our ideas were. And so I guess my question is, you know, to me, this was a moment of really being a public intellectual, of like we were literally in public talking about public things, talking about ideas together. And I found it very moving. And that's why we, um, and I still know a lot of these people and work with them uh, because of that day. And so the experience of Occupy began a shift for me. Um, and my organizing around indebtedness, so the Debt Collective, which Chandler mentioned, has really continued this. Um, and I just want to say I am giving a presentation about the Debt Collective Thursday, right, which we'll get into like the weeds because there's a lot of weeds <laughs> involved in, in challenging finance. But this experience started to change my idea of what an intellectual is. And so I think during my time at grad school, you know, I, I, I had the more conventional idea of this binary of like theory and practice and that these things were separate realms. And what I see now is how intellectually rich and challenging and like how demanding practice actually is. And now I find this binary between theory and practice, right? That there's like intellectuals who, and their job is to sit in the armchair and then there's like the doers who execute. Like not just odd, but, but actually incredibly counterproductive. And it's, it's an idea that's really prominent in our culture. I mean, even the way we tell, I mean, part of it is just depoliticizing, right? So we tell stories about people like Rosa Parks in this way, you know, that she's just this like tired lady who didn't want to give up her seat on the bus, right? As though it was just like a spontaneous emotion overcame her, not that she was trained uh, through the Highland uh, School and, you know, uh, in, in collaboration with communist organizers, you know, that she was, had a whole theory that informed her practice that day and a whole network around her. So I think, you know, part of it is that this binary is, um, is depoliticizing, but I also think a lot of intellectuals are invested in it, right? Like people will write in such a way that they're like, okay, well, I'm sort of writing the instruction manual for like the ideal revolution. And I think there are, um, you know, so, so people are, this is something that people want to uphold. Um, and I really think we need to break it down. 
And what I loved about the Occupy encampments, like, and this was sort of common through those, uh, a lot of the movements that started in 2011, was that you know, part of the, the way that they just obviously challenged this false division was with libraries. The library was always like the heart. And so this is just like a, pro, a library from Gezi Park. But these libraries were always sort of the, the center. Um, you know, there'd be a medic station, a kitchen, a library. So like feed your body, heal your body, and feed your mind. So Occupy opened this space of public intellectualism um, that I was really grateful for. You know, it was literally in public space, it was public spirited, it was about public issues, had the library. I was part of a group, um, a lot of people were from Impulse One magazine, but we made five issues of this broadsheet, the Occupy Gazette, um, and created a space in this broadsheet also for people to theorize about their experience. And I think it's worth mentioning too that you know one thing I insisted as one of the co-editors of this was I, I just was like, I'm not publishing a magazine if there's not like beyond gender parity, right? Like I'm just not doing it. And what was interesting is a lot of the writers at hand for us who like wanted to write about left-wing issues were like dudes in New York. Like those were the easy writers to solicit pieces from. So then when we imposed this rule of over gender parity, we had to look for writers because this is the thing, you do have to do more work to have the diversity and inclusion that you want. And so what was interesting is then we also went to people who like necess didn't necessarily identify as like writers or just intellectuals, but invited people from their encampments or from their communities around the world to write about their experiences. And I think it became a much richer and more interesting publication as a result. So when this move movement, you know, fizzled out, which it did pretty swiftly. I was trying to figure out how to, how to keep engaging in issues of economic justice and, um, and movement building in a way I felt was constructive, like what would be the movement that I would want to help design. It wouldn't just be an encampment in a park with a 24 hour a day drum circle. Um, what would it be? And you know, what we looked at was what, you know, what was it that galvanized people, what brought people, and you know, the issue of indebtedness was huge. Of course, like if I happened in the wake of the financial crisis, which was all the way about how, all about how debt was bundled and sold as a commodity. But it happened, like basically there's this one instance when I went to the park that was very visceral, and there was someone who had just brought this huge thing of butcher block paper, and they were standing as a kind of carnival barker, and they were saying, step right up and write down what you're worth to the 1%. And it was the second or third day of Occupy Wall Street. And they were just shouting this really loudly. And people were taking these markers. You can see people kind of hesitate. I kind of hesitated. And then they would come up and they would write these enormous sums. They would write, you know, $120,000 of student loans or, you know, $50,000 of credit cards or, you know, $200,000 on my underwater house or enormous medical debts. And it was this moment of public confession. Um, and that was very powerful to me. So it was this direct personal way of talking about a system that intellectuals or experts describe as neoliberalism, right? It's an economic a system that goes by various names like financialization or post-Fordism or sometimes optimistically or very scarily late capitalism. It's like, are we late in a good way? Or are we late in a really, 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 really devastating way? <laughs> I don't know. Um, but the thing is like, you know, what we can say, you know, so people argue about the history of this of the neoliberal turn and what it means and what drove it and what factors and what it looks like. But I think what we can say with confidence is that over the last 40 years, social provisions have been gutted, that we've moved from a welfare state to a debt fair state, that wages have flatlined and that we've had this sort of illusion of shared prosperity because of easy access to credit. Uh, we can say that the wealthy have been on a, on a sort of permanent tax revolt that actually began in California. Um, and that financiers have figured out how to wrap debt around every conceivable asset. So that day, you know, Occupy sort of just put neoliberalism in my face in a new way. And, you know, I was deeply indebted from the new school. So it really spoke to me personally. Uh, and that was where we got the idea for the Debt Collective. And so the idea it, for the Debt Collective, I mean, it can be expressed really simply. It's sort of like if everyone stepped right up and wrote down what they are worth to the 1%, it would be a huge sum. So collectively, Americans owe $1.5 trillion for their student loans. That's $1.5 trillion of leverage that we're just wasting, that we could use in a militant fashion if we were organized. 
So as Chandler said, we launched the first ever student debt strike in 2015. To date, we've won a billion dollars, over a billion dollars for our members through various strategies. And I also changed the federal law that now Betsy DeVos and her administration are dedicated to rolling back or hollowing out as much as possible. So if people want to learn about this, I really recommend you come to the, the workshop too because there's also, we can get, really get hands on in terms of looking at the debt, debt dispute platform we've made and stuff like that. Um, I mean, the thing is, and also what's, so what the interesting challenge of the debt collective is it's like, I had read so much. I'd read a lot of economics. I'd read a lot about the history of neoliberalism. But the, there's still these really thorny questions like, okay, so what do we do? How do we organize? If we're talking about a, a privatized and decentralized economic system, the challenge is that nobody actually knows what all the moving parts are, right? There are thousands of debt collectors out there. I mean, loan servicers are you know, not accountable to people. No, people know in theory how the economic system should work or like what the sort of uh, you know, regulatory protections are people have on paper, but the, the question is like, how do things work in practice? What are all of the moving parts? And mapping that from the bottom up is actually a really tricky thing and, and nobody has the full view. And then again, there's a question of strategy, like what do you do it? Where are the levers of power? Where can debtors actually make an impact? Um, you know, is it legal? Is it through exercising economic might and demanding, you know, a, uh, a debt relief or the right to collectively bargain? You know, so where is the power? Um, and the fact is, it's people on the bottom of this punishing economic system that have the most insight. And this is where I want to go with this, right? If you talk to people who are financially struggling, they actually ha often have great insight into cre credit scores, credit scoring systems or into the way that usurious interest rates compound, or the challenges of dealing with loan servicers and the way that the different options you know, are, are confusing or the uh, promises aren't kept. And so this, this is one thing that we found in our organizing is we sometimes have to like, explain our analysis less to people who are actually living in it than people who are sort of insulated and privileged. And you know, if you have wealth your whole life, you don't even know that you can actually, like, that a bank account doesn't always make you money, right? You have to be poor to know how much it costs to be poor. <laughs> so, you know, who, the question is who has the knowledge and who counts as an expert on matters of economics and also of matters of politics? And that's at the heart of this film, What is Democracy, right? So who, who should we be paying attention to? Who is an intellectual on these issues? Uh, and so, you know, it was making this, it was, you know, writing my book, thinking about the internet and the claims to democratize everything, Silicon Valley's claims that they were democratizing everything, and then organizing with debtors that made me wrestle more with this question of democracy that led me to my film and my current book. So, I don't know if, if you've been to like, you know, the average Barnes and Noble right now, but there are all these books on the crisis of democracy out, and they're typically on the front paper, front, sorry, front table, and they're like, how democracies die. Can democracy work? This is how democracy ends, like all these books. And what, I, what strikes me about these books, I wrote a piece in book form about it, but what strikes me about these books is that they're all written by very esteemed scholars, typically at Ivy League colleges. But a lot of these scholars were saying, like, they're now like in this crisis mode post Donald, the, post Donald Trump. And every, you know, I don't blame anyone who's in crisis after the election of Donald Trump. But these were scholars who sometimes even like five years ago were writing papers on like how everything was just great we're getting better. And so my, my point is like, why don't you stop writing for a minute and like reflect or learn or rethink? You know, why did you have to like rush to publish? And part of the argument of my film is that we've been listening to the wrong people. That maybe if we've been listening to different people and considered it had a wider range of experts to consult, <laughs> that maybe we wouldn't be in the same crisis that we're in. Um, Oh, I forgot some of the debt collective slides. So these are just this is just a meme. Let me share. This is from the Rolling Jubilee, which is our was one of our first campaigns, where we um, crowdfunded to to buy debts on the secondary market. Um, so, what is democracy? Is structured around conversations. Some of you may have seen it. Conversations with me. Conversations in groups. And in making this film, there's like one thing I really tried to do, and that was to approach every single person in it as though they were a philosopher, capable of abstract reflection, 
the thoughts, right? So I ask people serious things. You know, what is justice? Like, you know, what does democracy mean to you? And I wasn't sure that this would work or pay off, you know? And, but I felt by the end that it, that it really did. But this was something that was very important going into it. Um, and so I tried to treat everyone as though they were a philosopher, as though they were an intellectual. Um, but when I was making it at first, when I first started to make it sort of in classic mode, I was like, okay, so this is about speech, right? If I'm trying to show everyone as a philosopher, this is my, just my emphasis in the way I was framing it was on speech. It was like, this film will, will open space for a range of voices. There'll be like a diversity of, of people in the film. And so I was really thinking about the words, the speech, who is speaking. But as I got further along in the process into the edit, edit, I realized that I was missing, that my emphasis was kind of on the wrong thing. And that in the film, that listening is just as powerful and, it, and, and it's just as important to the act of engaging ideas and living an intellectual life. And that listening is like speech's unloved cousin. Um, so, you know, my, I think I've come to this point that, you know, a public, so it's thinking again, inspired by Chandler, this idea of public intellectual, which I don't really think about much, but is inspired by memories of the new school, right? So for me, there's another dimension to this idea, right? The public being uh, in the sense of collective, right? Or social, right? That actually, if you're a public intellectual, you're part of a community of speakers, and, and so therefore, listening has to be part of it. It's a collective endeavor that you do with other people. And that means also you can't be talking all the time. <laughs> so throughout the film, the importance of listening is demonstrated in a way, but mainly through me. So I play the role of the listener. And this is different than uh, you know, quite a few point of view documentaries or essay documentaries where the director might be present, but they're usually talking. They're like voicing things over or um, even direct address to the camera, right? Like a newscaster or like, I don't know, like Michael Moore or somebody like that. Um, whereas in my film, I'm, I'm, I made myself sort of as minimal as possible and I'm there and I'm asking questions and if you see a cutaway of me, I'm listening. And I'm listening really intently and giving attention to the person and saying, I value what this person is saying. I'm interested in what this person is saying. So I'm trying to do multiple things with this. One, I'm trying to show that listening is valuable. I mean, if we're gonna talk about democratic deliberation and uh, dialogue, then like listening, I just think we need to put listening back at the center of democratic exchange where it belongs. But I'm also trying to challenge the idea of what an intellectual is. So my film is very much, all my films are films about philosophy and ideas, right? And when we think about philosophy, we tend to think about people being really smart, right? And being impressive. And, and we see of professors professing and speaking smart words. We think about people answering questions less than we think about people asking them. And so to me, just you know, in my bones, to me being an intellectual is about being curious. It's about constantly asking questions and constantly wanting to learn, which means you're listening, whether you're listening to a book you're reading or a person. It's, it's, um, it's less about the answers, and that's why the film's title is a question. You know, it's not this is democracy, but what is democracy? I think of the film as an invitation to think together about this word, about its history. Um, and I think of this mode of, of being an intellectual as, as a very feminist mode. To me, there is something feminist in it, right? Um, because asking questions is considered to be weaker or somehow more vulnerable, vulnerable than being assertive, right, and having the answers. But I think I, uh, this feminist mode is important, and I, I think about the classicist Mary Beard. I don't know if any of you have read her books, but she says something about how we've been taught to think that deep voices are deep, right? So there's this question of like, you know, what, what thoughts impress us? Who gets to speak? And so, you know, one of the, my jokes, though, uh, related to this is that I would love to revoice over the films of Werner Herzog or Adam Curtis with a Valley Girl accent and just see how differently they play, right? And I think it would really transform them. And so uh, I think my film is a counterpoint to those. And it's also a counterpoint to the way that we think as a society, because we have so much emphasis on free speech, freedom of speech, the First Amendment. We're like obsessed with it. But we have no corresponding right to be heard, and we have no corresponding duty to listen. 
And I think our obsession with free speech has caused us to ignore this other dimension. I mean, of course, speech implies listening because why else would you talk? But it, you know, it's undervalued. And it's seen as passive when it's actually really hard, as anyone with a partner knows, right? Or an annoying coworker. You're just like, I don't want to listen to you. <laughs> you know, sometimes some listening can be way harder than, than running your mouth. And in fact, when I started to make this film again, and it's happened every time because I don't make films consistently, the thing I have to learn the most in terms of being a documentary filmmaker is actually just how to listen. Because your job when you're behind the camera, you know, it's it's not to take up space, it's to create space for others. And if you're too obsessed with what you're gonna say next, or getting a sound bite, or like getting through all of your questions on the page, you're gonna miss what's being said and not have an exchange that's really alive or I think, you know, worth worth keeping. So I just wanna wrap this up with a word I've been taking some inspiration from lately. So the film has a lot about ancient Athens, you know, not because the Athenians invented the practice of democracy, but because they did give us the word. Um, and the word is demos in kratia, it's people in power. Uh, and they had two concepts of speech. So the first concept of speech they had was parisia, which is frank and fearless speech, and it's sort of the freedom of speech we all are familiar with, the speaking truth to power. So freedom of speech. But they actually had this concept called esegoria, which was so crucial to them that sometimes it was used as a synonym for democracy. The words could be used interchangeably sometimes. And it means literally the strict equality of free public political speech. In other words, equality of speech, which is something that is almost unimaginable today, right? It's actually hard to imagine how that would play out. What would that even mean? But I kind of want to hold this idea. It's something I'm thinking about lately. Like, what would that mean, right? And as we think about how unequal our society is today and what to do, how to raise our voices, how to be heard, how to create change. I think that we have to veer away from trying to emulate the top-down speech of the powerful, right? Where messages are treated as commodities or we just need to like turn up the volume and shout louder. I think we need to experiment with new forms, new types of speech, new forms of public as in collective shared speech. Um, and so I wanna end with uh, another idea I encountered later after, as I was in the edit suite, but W.E.B. Du Bois gets mentioned in the film, Angela Davis mentions him, and so I read um, one of his essays, it's called Of the Ruling of Men, and he has this idea in the essay, he talks about excluded wisdom, and excluded wisdom is the wisdom democracy needs, is the wisdom of black people, working people, of women, and of children, uh, and this wisdom, he says, right, is the wisdom we need. It's not just like, and he says, and I think this is the thing I, I wanna wrap up with. It's not just that we should listen to them out of pity, right? Or register their opinions in a poll or something, but rather that this is, this is essential wisdom, that democracy actually needs to live up to its name, right? So these are actually the public intellectuals that we should be looking to. Um, people who have been excluded. And that it's not just about listening, but he said, you know, the solution is, uh, it's, it's not just hearing, right, but it's actually empowering people through economic democracy. And this is, I think, the, the, if we're gonna have equality of speech, it's got to have a material and economic uh, underpinning. And for me, the, he provides this insight, you know, to include the excluded wisdom, we need to expand democracy from the political into the economic sphere. And that's what I think freedom and also equality of speech would mean. So I want to end with that and invite you guys to ask any questions, also questions about all of the sort of logistical things of filmmaking and stuff like that that I ignored, all of the like thorny questions of not just the ideas that are in the movies, but you know, how do you get them made? How do you raise money? How do you get them out into the world? I'm happy to, to talk about anything. It doesn't have to just be the ideas driving things. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, a, con a conversation is not an invitation to be mansplained. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I like that. No, I think it's true. Yeah. It's an invitation to dialogue, not necessarily, it's not necessarily about getting the answer. Right, I agree. I might have answered all the questions though, which would be quite a feat. Yeah. 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 Well, I like the idea. Well, yeah, you can you can simulate a gadfly. I guess that's the philosophical mode, right? To be the Socratic gadfly, asking these questions. Yeah, but they are complicated questions. But I think. I mean, that's also that's the difference between engaging things in this sort of intellectual realm, which is, can be very meta, versus the political organizer mode, which is, has to be very concrete and strategic. So there are different realms. I just think that they inform each other. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. It's very quiet. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. That's, those are really big questions. <laughs> um, I mean, the yeah, the. I mean, I first I wrote the first sorry I wrote the first email to my producer about the film in 2013, and then the proposal I wrote in 2014. I mean, I was doing other things at the time. I was like working on the Debt Collective and touring with a band. But I, it was all, I was all trying to sort of, you know, think about what the film would look like. And so that initial proposal has way more locations. I mean, I don't know what I was thinking. I, I, and I don't know how they possibly gave the approval because it just would have been like a 10 part series. It was all over the place. But then when I actually was faced with the challenge of making the film, I, you know, I knew I wanted to have a loose digressive structure. So for inspiration, I was looking at films like Chronicle of a Summer uh, and Le Jolly May, which is the, a Chris Marker film, which are these like early 60s sort of beginning of verite documentary films. and it, there are all these conversations about politics and sort of interviews with random people, but they're very digressive. They're like, they don't have a cohesive 
linear storyline, they're always like almost falling apart, which is a feeling I really like. So I knew I wanted to have that feeling of just like kind of being like, where am I going? And then coming back. Um, but yeah, by the time I was actually filming, um, you know, I had been to Athens right after the referendum, and it just felt like it snapped everything into focus because it led me to go back to the beginning of political philosophy. Um, both Greece and the United States were sort of these, they were living out the sort of parable Plato warned about, so it just seemed a way to contain some of the concepts I wanted to play with. And then I went to Siena, Italy, as a place to so kind of visualize the story of the origins of capitalism, because that was the other thread. So, you know, it was really, a, it, on some level, it was just like, what can I do that feels like it's big enough, but is um, actually, I can actually execute it in places where I have enough of a connection. So like almost all the scenes are, um, and this is true in Athens as well. I mean, it's sort of like me reaching just beyond my activist community. So I'd sort of start somewhere where I had sort of trust and people who would like sort of open their community to me and then build out from there. So that also limited me because it's like, I can't just pop in anywhere and expect access. I had to go places where I was connected and had that, um, that to build on. Uh, and I also knew that I was writing, so I'm writing a, or I wrote it, actually it's coming out in May, but a companion book. And so there I knew that I could be much bigger in the companion book and include all of the places and ideas and things that I couldn't fit in the film because there's so much that's not, it's not just that there's other places that aren't in the film, there's like all sorts of populations and all sorts of concepts and all sorts of issues like climate change isn't addressed, right? So the book was this place. I think I was able to like marshal the project and and actually just like let it go because I knew that I could put everything else I was thinking about in the book, which is right here. <laughs> and so it comes out May 7th. So I don't know, that's another strategy is like book as a crutch so that you can actually manage life in the edit suite. The Canadian issue, I mean, I am Canadian, and it was just, you know, it was sort of, um, there's so many reasons. I had a whole complicated Canadian storyline that I had to abandon because it was just too much. Um, so that's the answer. Uh, as far as your question about, I mean, the thing is like, do we change the system or work in the ones we have? Like, we can't just snap our fingers and change the system. Like, I'd love to abolish the system, but you know, inherent in the idea, at least like the, you know, idea of abolition Angela Davis talks about is that, you know, it's a dismantling of the old way and a building of the new structures. And so I think the thing is we have to work on all of these multiple fronts at once. You know, we have to, have to undo horrible things. We have to build up new models and experiments. We also, activism is, all, I mean, our political projects are always rooted where we are. So the question is, are you somewhere where you could join a like vibrant labor movement? Are you somewhere where it makes sense to do solidarity centers? Are you somewhere where if you had a few radical city council people you know, if you like socialists or communists on the city council, could make really interesting things happen. Like it's so specific to your place. There isn't necessarily one, a one size fits all answer. And I think this, it's not just that like a reform or a revolution is a false choice. It's just that literally for those of us who do want revolution, it's, it's literally not an option on the table. So, you know, I think we have to, it's not just like do both, we have to do it all. We have to be open to every strategy. That, that we can, and it's so rooted on, it's so tied to where we actually live and, and what's possible in the place. So that's part of why I tried to approach some of the things. I tried to approach the different stories in the film. I tried to almost like get rid of enough of the details so that they would seem sort of universal, right? So like there were edits, you know, earlier edits where it just got too like lost in the weeds of it. So it became too specifically about that place and less about like worker co-ops in general or healthcare in general, you know, because we are facing general, we're facing similar problems in different communities, but then like the nitty gritty of how to address them, you know, has to be figured out by people who are actually there. So, but thank you. Uh, I, I guess I'm curious, you've spoken about this a little bit, but I guess I'm curious how you've come to terms with the idea of being a, a sort of single creator or the source of a vision for something that's really about the collective. You know, mm -hmm. this could, you could have crowdsourced the interviews and had a submission call for submissions and sort of 
-hmm. had them assembled by the, you know, there are other processes that would speak to the democratic or the collective yeah. in a more clear way. Not to say those are superior, but how do you come to terms with the fact that you're taking this yeah. more singular vision role? Yeah. Um, you know, I think, you know, films are dictatorial, they're collaborative, but they're not democratic. I mean, there is like a sort of dictatorial element because ultimately it's on the director that every, every choice, whether it's, you know, like ultimately I think like hundreds of people collaborated to it, but in it, but if you didn't like it, it's on me. Um, I think my, like, it's not really a theoretical answer. It's more of a personal answer. It's just I have so much collaboration in my life that it wasn't what I was needing. So because the film came out of organizing to, I felt, you know, an urge to sort of get space and reflect, right, and have, and to sort of think these problems through. And I think this is where I really do have a division between, you know, my films are art, they're not, it's not building power. And then I have my organizing, which is about trying to create new avenues for economic disobedience and building the sort of, you know, movement that I think would be useful and complementary to other forms of organizing at this time. So I think it's because I have these multiple tracks going at the same time that it, that's just not what I need. I didn't need to be organizing more people, and especially not creatively. Like I'd rather organize people politically and be in collaboration for a, a cause that I felt was also broader because the thing is like the organizing work, so we organize around indebtedness. So we have an incredibly you know, interesting constituency in the fact that unlike a sort of labor union which is based in the workplace, People have common creditors, but they're spread out across the country. So you get this incredibly geographically diverse, age diverse, racially diverse group of people. Um, where, and so that, yeah, that feels like a better source for my energy if I want to work with other human beings in that way. Yeah. I really love the title of this book. Oh, thank you. And it seems <laughs> like you're coming to the in a very subtle way. I mean. Is it even possible? Uh, even in Athens, Pericles was not a common man. No, he yeah. didn't rise up from the bottom and yeah. through his popularity achieve preeminence. He was an aristocrat. Well, I think this speaks to her comment too. I would say you know we've never had a democracy. So yeah, that's, there are uh, a lot of people yeah. that say that. Yeah, yeah I think so that that's what, true. What is it? What are we talking about? And I, I have a feeling you're delving into that issue. Oh, I don't know. You're going to have to buy the book. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, just yeah. That. I mean, my, the, the book is organized around each chapter is a paradox. And so a paradox that I think is going to be eternally sort of central to democracy. So not a Marxist contradiction, not the, the, the clash between, you know, capital and labor or owners and workers, because I can imagine a, I can imagine a world where that doesn't, that's not the guiding principle of the economy. But I still think even in a, in a you know, socialist paradise, we still have to figure out how do we balance the needs of people who live now with people who haven't been born how much structure or planning is there versus how much spontaneity, right? There are still these tensions that you'd have to work through. In fact, I think we'd have, our, I think we'd have way more interesting democratic dilemmas in an economically egalitarian world than we have now. I think now we're just really dealing with like the boring stuff, which is like, you know, like the border is, you know, is racist <laughs> and like women are people too. And no, maybe there shouldn't be billionaires. Like these to me seem, it seems to me there are better questions to come if we can keep going as a species. Yeah, but these are great, <laughs> these are great questions. Yeah. How do you get there? I mean, Organize. Can, well, the answer to me, so to me, my answer is organizing. Yeah, yeah that's, that is my answer. I think the writing and the filmmaking is optional. <laughs> I wish Thank you, you luck. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sort of on your side. But yeah. I don't see how to get there. <laughs> Um, so this is like taking it back a few years, um, but uh, I remember you, I think it was a joint article with someone else, and I can't remember who you mm -hmm. wrote it with, but um, it was called The Dads of Tech oh, and yeah. The Baffler, and I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit about, um, I sort of felt like that article was about personal experiences maybe you weren't sharing in the article oh, yeah. about um, kind of not being taken seriously as a cultural critic surrounding the area of technology 
And I don't know the timeline, whether you were working on people's platform at the same time, but clearly you were like involved in this world where maybe you felt like no one was taking you seriously yeah. as a critic of technology for certain reasons, maybe like involving your, your background as a philosopher as opposed to yeah. someone making technology happen yeah. or something, right? So I was, I kind of would like to hear you talk about that just a little bit if you have time. Um, and I feel like you predicted a lot of things, like, you know, once filter bubble idea came out after the election and ev like everyone can critique Facebook now. Yeah. But um, I'm wondering if you feel like people are taking you more seriously than they were mm -hmm. 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. I do get like a tweet a day that's like, you're right, which wow. is nice. <laughs> but you know, it's funny, that article, I mean, I think on the one hand, people did take my book really seriously considering the fact they didn't have sort of a tech background or programmer background. But uh, I'm trying to tap into like, what was the motivation of Joanne and I writing that piece, which made the dads of tech so mad. <laughs> oh my God, we just got BC like angry emails. And they're like, what have you got against dads? <laughs> we were just like, not all dads. Um, I think, you know, it's so, it wasn't based on anything towards me personally, like a personal memory. It was more that it's, it's not, it's not that I was being sort of suppressed. It's that people were just almost like they were being sucked up in this pneumatic tube and elevated to these stages when their ideas were just totally crap. You know, so it was, um, uh, but it's interesting, you know, I personally got more pushback after Examine Life. Like I just, I was actually just looking at the People's Platform the other day and there's a memory in it I had forgotten. And that every screening I would go to and do a Q and A, somebody in the audience, an older guy in the audience would be like, hold on, did you ask the questions? And the implication was that I was just smart enough to think that I should make a philosophy film, but not smart enough to ask the questions. So I'd like hired a guy to ask them for me and then maybe I'd like voiced over in my own voice or something, right? It was just like, yeah, I asked the questions, you know? Um, whereas with the, the uh, people's platform, I, I think it was more that the critique at that moment was just, a little too radical, you know. But you were right. Yeah, but I think I was right. But I think what's interesting now is that the the conversation has flipped. So it's gone from this like sort of techno utopian to this like techno dystopianism, and they're both they both give the technology too much credit. When again, the problem is economics and what's driving it. So it's sort of I almost find myself my urge now is to be more like no, we you know we can still use digital technology in really interesting ways. Right? The problem is how are we going to sustain our projects? So I have built this whole debt dispute platform that's taken our group years to build because I think the idea of using data, data collection for collective action is a really interesting possibility. The problem is that you're going to have a really hard time getting the programming help and expertise that you need when they can be paid a lot more figuring out how to get people to click on ads. Right? So. It's, it's interesting to me how the conversation has shifted, but I don't have, yeah, I don't have a, a personal anecdote. I think it just, the, the general tech the conversation just irritated me, so it was more like an article that was written out of frustration. So I, I, and I think, you know, muses are interesting thing, like what motivates you to be creative, and sometimes dark muses are really good, and I got a lot of muse out of just how annoyed I was by people writing about the internet in that period. But I'm trying to turn towards more positive inspirations <laughs> these days. <laughs> Thank you, though. All right, should we wrap it up? I'm like spacing out over here. <laughs> Thank you all for coming.